Hello and welcome to our weekly share with the commentary of the Alshah HaKadosh. Um, the uh, dedications, I think we should start with. Chaim Mordecha ben of Esther, Rafal Chaim ben Sora, Ore Chaim ben Chani Yehudas, Arne Yedidia ben Sparachava, Miri Riva Bas Tzivia, and Rachel Lavana Bas Shirley. All of those should have Rafael Shalema, uh, continued health, and if you would like to dedicate the share for somebody's Rafur Shalema or to celebrate any good Jewish idea, uh, sorry, event, um, because I'm sure you would agree it's a good idea, then please um, do me a favor and send me an email to yy at askrabbyy.com. Uh, also, I'd like to thank my friends at uh, Tara Anytime who uh, carry the share on their platform uh, and do remarkable work. Uh, obviously. Uh, also, uh, as I said in the last few weeks, uh, a suggestion from them, very clever, why not share um, and uh, spread the word of the Alsha share. This week's share, I have to admit, is very, very short. Uh, simply, i um, uh been a very, very busy week and I'm about to uh, drive four hours to uh, Pennsylvania to speak to the girls' school over Shabbaton, so my time is a little bit limited. Um, when my when my wife and I were joining the family in the neighborhood, we always uh, joined for well, always for the last since we've been here in our neighborhood of Inwood and in Long Island um, for the last well, I think seven years. We joined a certain family, and this year, sitting across from me, they told me it was a special guest. One of the other guests had found a lady, uh, an elderly lady, and she was coming to join the Suda. Uh, I don't know what her relationship is with Judaism. Um, but she's an Auschwitz survivor, a lovely, fabulous lady who wrote a book. Uh, and she very, very uh, kindly gave me this book. Um, that's her as a young lady, um, originally from Czechoslovakia, went to Auschwitz, age 12. Anyway, I was sitting next to the father-in-law of the, of the host, who was a very dear friend and um, a doctor. And he said, you know, she was in Auschwitz, he whispered. And I said, um, yes, I already heard. You can you can ask her about it. I said, Shh. Because of course, people who've been through such hell, um, maybe they don't want to talk about her. You have to you have to be very careful. I said, no, she's already been speaking about it. And during the course of the meal, uh, after I was invited to say something about Purim, then our host, Scott David, said uh, to Rosalie, the young lady, the young lady that I just showed you, um, well not so young these days, um, would she like to speak? And she told her story. That was interesting because uh, there's lots of little kids there. And you know what little kids are like, running about, you know, banging off walls, noisy. Um, but everybody felt completely silent as she told her story and how she managed to meet Mengele and three se separate Selexias and somehow miraculously got through them. Of course, 12 year olds were originally killed. Um, the story was absolutely astonishing. I think it was the the bits of the story when she was waiting to in the line to confront Mengele. That it's the waiting, as the town says, the, of all the worst things in the world, waiting uh, for them to happen is the worst of all. But the reason that I'm going to speak for this school, uh, sorry, the school uh, in Pennsylvania, which is as I don't tell my wife, I don't mention this in case anybody who watches this as a friend of hers, but she thinks it's only three hours, and frankly, so did I, but it turns out to be four hours. And I don't think she's going to be very pleased when she discovers, but I will save her the the anguish by not letting her know. And maybe you could share me in this mitzvah ganada of avoiding her any distress. Um, the, the, it's very interesting, the, the breakdown of the school, it's a, a, an orthodox from school. I asked the lady who I've been working with, the Rebson Cross, What's the demographic? So it's mostly Haredi girls, but there are some more modern Orthodox girls uh, as well. And she said a very interesting thing that the the um, more Haredi girls, they are very limited in their access to you know the big world out there. So they don't really know what's been going on since October the seventh, um, uh, with the the threat hanging over Klal Yisrael. Um, organization of terrorists who not only committed the animalistic slaughter on October 7th, but have promised to keep repeating the process, very much a, a period of uncertainty. 
And as we said a second ago, uncertainty, worrying about what's coming is is worse than anything else. But still, the, the girls who have more modern Orthodox backgrounds, whose parents are trying to shelter them from the worst news, but still, they can read in the faces and the expressions and the tones of the voices of their mums and dads that something's amiss, something's not normal, and that's filtered through to the whole school as well. So frankly, if I'm really being honest, Friday, um, I'd rather stay at home um, and just enjoy Shabbos with my wife and our guests. However, uh, I think this is a, a big mitzvah to go and uh, try and see something that might help these girls uh, and these very worrisome times. This week's Parsha is, of course, the Parsha of Tzav in the Yikra. So let's uh, remind ourselves. I have my little art scroll commission, which I, it's very useful. My desk is quite small, apart from other reasons. Be'edabra Hashem al Moshe Limor, Hashem speaks to Moshe to say, Tzav is Aaron, command Aaron, uh, as one of his sons, Limor Zeis, Teres Oila. This, these are, is the Torah of the Laws of the Oila. And that's the burnt sacrifice, the one that starts the day. He oil is the oil al mikta on the on the uh, on the fire, al mizbeach on the altar. Call a light that burns all that night. Add a biker in the morning. But ish mizbeach took it, that the fire should burn and consume it. And of course, the corn got the corn comes and clears off all the ashes, etc. And then the rest of the base sacrifices take place. That's the the opening words of the parsha. All the commentators are intrigued by why it says Tzav. Normally, when Hashem speaks to Moshe, or speaks to Aaron, it's Omar and Daber. But Tzav is a very, very, it's a very strong, it's instruct, command. Or Tzav is Aaron, command Aaron. So if you look in your little art scroll, assuming, or maybe the big version, <clears throat> um, he uh, it starts off in this introduction by saying, we've already discussed these sacrifices in the previous chapter. So why is it coming back to it now? That's the obvious question. Number two, why does it say Tzav? And so there are various explanations. Tzav, what Rashi bring, uh, cites the, his, his explanation is, uh, there is a very strong commandment because if a, a, a mitzvah uh, entails financial sacrifice, like giving money to charity, there is a part of us, that one called the Yitzhara, which is reluctant in, uh, to perform the mitzvah. Here, there is a certain financial loss, as it were, because the Kohanim, who normally get some of the meat from the sacrifice given to them as part of, I don't know, part of the, the process. I was going to say the compensation, but I hope Kohanim don't do it for that. But obviously, there is a compensatory uh, element to that. But basically, that's uh, omitted when it's the, the burnt uh, sacrifice, because everything is reduced to complete ashes. So they might, as it were, not be doing it with as much passion. That's Rashi's explanation, and I mean, he's not making up, it's from Madrashim. There are various other explanations, but we're going to have a quick look, and instead, this is going to be a short share, uh, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, what the al has to say. Um, he certainly uh, likes the idea of um, the, the uh, told to be particularly careful of this mitzvah, but he's not terribly satisfied with that answer, or he doesn't consider the answer to be sufficient. So he says the following thing. Uh, well, maybe I'll just tell you the first question. We've got to understand here. Um, the question, why does it say Tzav and not Daber? But you do, Mam Ramzal, and we know that the Gemara says Kedushin, Rashi cites this, that Tzav is to be Zoris, to be uh, passionate and energetic in performing the mitzvah. And as he said, it goes on to the, the answer of, you know, maybe if you know you're not making a lot of money out of this, so you're not being compensated for this, maybe it's going to be the case that you won't do it with sufficient um, uh, alacrity, um, assiduousness. Um, however, um, the Asher takes it in a different direction. So I'm going to read a little bit of Asher. Even though this has indeed already been mentioned before at the beginning of the book of the Yikra and the Sedra of the Yikra, it mentions the it mentions these uh, the sacrifices. Why does it repeat it here? The answer is because Hashem wanted Lazarus is Aaron Ubona to make sure that Aaron and his uh, sons were fully fired up, fully 
impassion, is there such a word? But avoid us a grabonus kulund considering shneas, with all that's involved in offering up the sacrifices, and even to the extent of st- stating a second time. Um, to emphasize to them that there's an element here that I don't think anybody else focuses on. What does the post say? Uh, that the whole sacrifice is taking place on the Mizbech. And he returns to a theme which we've, we've visited in the al before, that the Mizbech below, the last few weeks we've been talking about this, is a reflection, a mirror image of the Mizbech in Shemaim. As Sefer Nefesh Achaim, Rukhaim Belozhin, points out, that one of the reasons the angels were extremely uh, reluctant, to put it mildly, um, almost in revolt about the idea of the Jewish people getting the Torah, is because when we get the Torah, we become the catalyst for everything that happens in the entire universe. When we say the words kadosh, 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 that incidentally was the praise, the phrase that the angels use, whatever that means, to praise God, when we now, having accepted the Torah, when we say that, then and only then can they say that. We unite and connect all of the worlds in a way that the angels can't do. When it comes to the Mizbeach, that's the message that's being imparted. Be particularly careful about this mitzvah, because what you're doing is um, acting as a catalyst to allow what's happening here to be reflected and indeed uh, continued in, uh, in, in Shemaim. There's going to be a parallel thing going on there. This is very interesting. He, he says it's got to be to Aaron and his sons. This is your job. You on a spiritually higher level then you are going to get this message and therefore you'll be able to perform this message in a way that nobody else can. That's the basic idea of the al here. Now, maybe if this shir was to be given the title, it would be The Critical Importance of Remembering. We know, of course, because we just finished Purim, that, of course, Purim is um, ushered in through uh, as reading Pasha Zohar, the Torah commands us to remember Amalek and what they did to us, that uh, October 7-ish attack on a much, much larger scale, uh, that's to be a constant memory, something we always remember. Uh, on top of that, we're coming, of course, to, up to Pesach. When we come to Pesach, Pesach is a whole story of remembering. Zechah, um, we see it's right. But the point of, of memory and the point of remembering Mitzrayim and Amalek and all the things that Hashem has done for us throughout our history is not tied to any particular festival. It's a daily process. We're supposed to remember what Hashem has done for us in our lives all of the time. It's something that Ramban says, you'll find this in Sefer Haredim. Um, <clears throat> Chapter, uh, chapter 7, I remember rightly. Um, then it says there, there's a mitzvah of remembering. It's a daily thing. You mustn't forget. If you uh, start to forget, then you get in trouble. But you're supposed to remember all the miracles Hashem has done for the Ovos, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and their wives, and their, ch- their children. The fact he took us from Mitzrayim, the f- fact he took us out from Mitzrayim, all the miracles happened after that the continual miracles in our lives as a nation, the continual miracles in our lives as individuals, as families, um, the history of the Jewish people. But Hashem is there. And even when it seems to be times are, as it were, scary, as they clearly are now, which, as I said, is the reason why I'm going to speak to these 300 girls, um, we need reassurance that the most important thing we could possibly do is remember. There is a a scary um, and well-known saying of the rabbis, which is, let the Mashiach come quickly, but don't let me see it. You know, when we're really scared, or remember when we were little children, when we were really scared, then it was obviously the case that we uh, closed our eyes. You just don't want to see. You don't want to open your eyes until, as it were, it's all over. Um, And in a sense... And it occurred to me just a few moments before I switched on the computer to record this year, the rabbis are saying, let it happen, but don't let me see it. Um, because the times before the coming of the Mashiach would be 
dramatic and frankly horrible. So therefore you close your eyes. And I've heard people uh, since October the 7th saying, I just want to close my eyes or hide in bed um, and not come out or not open my eyes again until it's all over to somehow the world will go back to the way that, that it was. So maybe we're not so far from being little children ourselves if all we want to do is to close our eyes. But you really shouldn't close your eyes. You have to have your eyes wide open and you have to remember exactly the interactions that you've had or Hashem has had with you throughout all of your life, all of our lives. And as we all know, because I've quoted this often uh, so many times, um, the Ramban at the end of Parsha's boy in recording the big dramatic miracles of Mitzrayim, and you see it's Mitzrayim, says Hashem doesn't do miracles on that scale for us all the time. In fact, it was a unique, obviously a unique set of events. Um, and we are people whose faith is not has of shalom blind faith. We don't believe in that. The Ramban says we don't believe in that. He says, from what Hashem showed us in Mitzrayim, that forced us to a conclusion, forced us to a conclusion that he was there, not elsewhere in the galaxy doing whatever people imagine him to be doing, those are people who, who actually imagine him to exist at all. But rather, he's the here. From the moment he created this world, he is here. Well, he's everywhere. But he's supervising and intervening every single event in this world. When we say in, in the Shemana Esra, Boni Yerushalayim, it's in the present tense, is building a Yerushalayim. Uh, but Hashem is, is, is there all the time. But the, he then famously goes on to say that from the little miracles, the big miracles, you see the little miracles that are happening all the time. And you have to remember those little miracles. Remembering is the critical thing. You've got to remember the Rabban Shalom is there. And his plan is already set. Moshe Arena says that. When the Jewish people are facing that Egyptian army bearing down on them, then he says to them, look, the army you see now, you won't see ever again. What you're seeing now is going to change. Yeshua's Hashem Keheravayan, the vault fast, the change, the flip of the coin from the heads to the tails. That can happen in the blink of an eye, Keherif Ayan, and everything changes. We have seen that so many times through our history. But of course, when we go through uh, dark times, we, we want to close our eyes. I don't want to see it. Because yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> let me see it come, but don't let me, but don't let me see it. And one minute from this shrine, to move on from, that, from one famous uh, Spanish uh, Rishon, the Ramban, to another one, his predecessor, the Ramban. The Ramban says, that there is no doubt at all, even the most skeptical, most cynical Jew, having gone through all of the miracles of Mitzrayim, when they came to Mount Sinai, then it was settled once and for all. We knew. We don't believe in blind faith. We had 600,000 witnesses. They passed that through the generations. But sometimes, even though we are Bali Betochen, we have Betochen, and Betochen, of course, is translated in my um, commentary on the using Romanticeal Solomon, Zechazad Evrocha's translation, but often means certainty. So even though we have certainty, a certainty based on fact and evidence and witnesses, sometimes that faith wobbles when we go through difficult times, tough times, like we're going through now. That's when you have to remember. That's when you have to open your eyes again. And remember all the things Hashem has done for us. But there's something else that because I'm rushing away, I'll have to finish with this, just this point. There's something else to remember. You know, of course, whenever Hashem says something's going to happen, it's a good thing, it's always going to happen. When he says it's a real prophet, how you can tell a prophet is a real prophet? He says Hashem uh, said something good, it's good, good, good is going to happen, it must happen. He said something bad is going to happen, it may happen. So he, if a prophet turns around and says something's good going to happen, and uh, Hashem said something good is going to happen, and it doesn't, that means he's a false prophet. Because whatever Hashem says is going to happen, is going to happen. So, you know, when we're going through tough times and our inclination uh, is to close our eyes, I want to remind you of something that Hashem told the Navi Yirmiyahu. You'll find this in chapter 16 of um, Yirmiyahu and it's verse 14 and 15. Listen to this, particularly for us who might want to stick our heads under the pillow and not come out until it's all over. Leave your eyes to wide, closed, you know, closed, tight, shut. You might miss some incredible stuff. Listen. 
Hashem gives you a promise. He says, you know, days are coming. People will no, no longer say, Chai Hashem, praise God, the living God, who brought the Jewish people out from its right. Full stop. Next passage, test off. Keep me Chai Hashem. People say, Chai Hashem, the living God, Asher Hello is being thrown the Eretz Tzofen, who took the Jewish people out from the lands of the north, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, New York, um, and from all the lands that he scattered them. And he's put them back, all of us, in the land which he promised to our forefathers. Yeah, there are times which are scary and make us want to close our eyes and hide. But if you've got your eyes closed, you won't see that in the, in the, the clicking of a finger, or as the rabbis say, in the blink of an eye, everything can change. Everything has changed in the past. Um, an Egyptian army disappears, a home in threatening clouds disappears. It's all in the blink of an eye. You just have to remember, we've already proven that process. We are Bali Betochen. We're people who are certain. And even if we wobble for a little bit, we have to remember. So we get our equilibrium back on track and our eyes are wide open to see something that's going to make the miracles of Mitzrayim look like child's play. Miracles of a greater magnitude on the way very soon. I wish you all the wonderful Shabbos. Sorry, the share is so short and is, is um, not the depth we usually pl- uh, plumb. But I hope to see you again next week when I'm not rushing for a four hour drive. Don't tell my wife. Shabbos.